uh, defense. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, how far would you go? How far would you go to protect someone that you cared about? How far would you go to protect your loved ones, your child, your children? Now you've heard, we've all heard a very compelling case from the state about what actually happened, but it's not really accurate. And the way you're gonna find out it's not really accurate is that the question of how far you would go is going to be a far more important question for you than some of the facts that he laid out. Now, the state gave you a large, large story about what happened, about starting when family members couldn't contact James Whitaker, when they were struggling to figure out where he was at, when they came around. But all of that is sort of peripheral to the main issue of what happened in this case. What happened in this case on one night, the night when Michael Dixon was faced with having to shoot somebody to protect his daughter. Now, you're going to hear a lot of testimony in this case. And what that testimony is going to point to is the story that Michael Dixon has told. Now, is it true that Michael Dixon did not initially disclose what happened? Yes. I'm not going to sit up here and, and lie to you and make you try to figure it out. In fact, Michael Dixon has told you, or will be telling you, through all the evidence, what happened. And the reason is, the reason they know what happened is because Michael Dixon told them. He told them what happened that night. And what happened is this. Here's what you're going to hear happen. Michael Dixon was out at a friend's house overnight. They were using drugs. It's not going to be a surprise to anybody. And they were fixing a car. In the early morning hours, Mr. Dixon and his daughter went back to the house that they shared with James Whitaker. As already stated, Mr. Dixon I've been living there for several years. Melody came and started living with them several months before. And when they arrived, James Whitaker was waiting up for them with a gun in his hand and started yelling and screaming, saying, get out, alleging all kinds of crazy stuff. Now, why was Mr. Whitaker in the state at four or five in the morning? No one really knows. Mr. Dixon doesn't know. He can only presume that he was also using drugs because they had all used drugs before. And while Mr. Dixon and Mr. Whitaker were yelling at each other, apparently a common occurrence, Melody went to walk past Mr. Whitaker to use the restroom. At this point, Mr. Whitaker told Mr. Dixon, it's time for you to leave, but Melody's staying here with me, and had a gun pointed at her. Mr. Dixon had already retrieved a firearm to protect himself because Mr. Whitaker had threatened his life. But now, not only was his life threatened, his daughter's life was threatened. He saw Mr. Whitaker with a gun pointed at her face, with his hand on her throat, holding her arm, alternately. And then Mr. Dixon heard something, a click, a click of the safety being released. And it was at this point that Mr. Dixon had to make a decision. Do I continue talking to a man who's probably on drugs with a gun pointed at my daughter's face or do I make the decision I need to make? And he shot. Now, I'm telling you this because this story is not a surprise. The reason it's not a surprise is because Mr. Dixon told this story to law enforcement. Mr. Dixon did a walkthrough of the crime scene and showed them moment by moment what happened, where he was standing, where everyone else was standing. He gave them the story. And while the state might say that he lied, 
and that he made decisions leading up to that, that might be true. In fact, I'm not going to deny that to any of you. I don't think he will either. He's not going to deny that he cleaned up the scene. He's not going to deny that he moved things around. He's not going to deny that he burned Mr. Whitaker's body. And I recognize that, that is distasteful. I recognize that that can be a disgusting thought. But I want to get that all out here now so you all are prepared to hear about this because this is something that did happen. Now, is there a good explanation for that? For trying to hide his crimes? That's yet to be determined, I suppose. But the reality is, those are not the big issues in this case. Because while the state is going to tell you to take this broad view and look at the entirety of it, this case really breaks down to 60 seconds. 60 seconds from when Michael Dixon walked into that house, retrieved a firearm, saw his daughter in substantial danger of serious physical harm, if not death, and he pulled the trigger. That is what you're going to be tasked with looking at. Now, the state wants you to believe that Mr. Dixon has said lie after lie on top of lie on top of lies, but that's not really accurate. Initially, did he cover things up? It appears so. The evidence will probably show that. Initially, when other family members asked him about this, was he upfront and honest with them? No, he was not. But the question is, once he was in custody and talking to police officers, was he honest? And ladies and gentlemen, I submit you will find that the answer is yes. In fact, as you see what Mr. Dixon was doing in his walkthrough, you're going to see how honest he was, how specific he was, and how, when he told them what he did, officers found he was being truthful. This fire pit that's referenced, this is not a small bucket. It is huge, huge area. And yet Mr. Dixon was able to show exactly where the body was located. This is not something the officers would have easily found on their own. He told them, and he was being truthful. When he said, here's where the shooting happened, here's where Mr. Whitaker died, officers looked around and they found evidence consistent with his story. They found evidence consistent with a body having died there, with a person having died there. He was being truthful. And I recognize that right now, the thought is, how can we trust someone who killed someone else and took all these other steps? And I recognize that is a difficult ask. But the fact is, he was truthful about maybe terrible things, maybe the terrible things he did, but he was truthful about that. And what the state's asking you to do is believe that he was truthful about some things. He was truthful about some of the tampering that may have taken place. He was truthful about cleaning some things up. He was truthful about where the body was. He was truthful about using this or that apparatus. But the one thing he wasn't truthful about was the self-defense. They want you to sort of carve that out of his story and say, yes, while he was truthful about all these other things, while he led investigators on a point-by-point -point story as to where the body was, about how this evening transpired, he was somehow not truthful about this one other aspect. And I would ask you to consider, does that make sense? Does that make sense that this individual would tell the truth about literally every other part of it, but not why the killing happened? What was going on when the killing happened? I would submit that after the evidence comes out, it just won't make sense. 
Occam's razor says that the most obvious answer is typically the right one. The most obvious answer is that when he did this entire walkthrough, when he told the whole story, you'll be able to judge for yourself, but it seems like he's just giving the story. He wasn't shying away from having killed Mr. Whitaker. He told them what happened. He wasn't shying away from saying, I was on drugs. And what will a drug addict do in a time of crisis? Just try to make it go away right then and there. Doesn't think about the future. Doesn't think about how these other actions might lead to other charges. That wasn't his thought process. His thought process was, I just killed somebody defending my daughter and now there's a body there. What do I do? And he did what another drug addict would do. Try to get rid of it. Try to forget about it. Try to move on to the next point in his life, hoping it would go away. So, ladies and gentlemen, After days of testimony, I think what you're going to find is that though distasteful, though difficult to understand, though possibly not something any of us could consider happening in our lives, this is truly what happened. Mr. Dixon came upon a scene, a drug-fueled scene involving a threat to his family, to his daughter, and he took the steps necessary to protect her, to save her life. Ladies and gentlemen, you're going to also hear from Mr. Dixon that his daughter had nothing to do with this. Now, the state's going to say that his daughter was somehow involved. Mr. Dixon's going to say that's not the case. He's going to take full responsibility, as he did when he did that walkthrough with police, as he did when he told them what happened. He's going to take full responsibility for his conduct. And he's going to tell you that when it happened, he told his daughter, Melody, just go downstairs, go away. I'm going to take care of this. And he did. So while the state is going to try to explain to you that there was this mass conspiracy of what happened, there was this pattern of behavior, this cohort of persons who came together to try to hide all these actions, in the end, it was really just Mr. Dixon, and he fully accepts that. He's taken full responsibility for that. And so, in the end, ladies and gentlemen, as you've already heard, there's not a whole lot in dispute here. There's not a lot in dispute about what took place because he told everybody what happened. You're going to be tasked with about 60 seconds of time. It won't matter what happened before, it won't ha matter what happened in the hours or days or weeks after this incident. You're going to be tasked with figuring out what happened in those 60 seconds and whether Mr. Dixon did in fact save his child's life. Thank you.